Welcome to the PharmaSource podcast. Today's episode is an interview with Amalia Adler Waxman, Senior Vice President of ESG and Head of Corporate Affairs of International Markets at Teva Pharmaceuticals, based in Tel Aviv. Amalia has a fascinating and global career, including NGOs, the World Health Organization, international affairs for companies such as Pfizer, before Teva. Teva has recently been awarded various accolades for their performance in sustainability, including an independent Time magazine ranking, which puts them as the number one company in Israel for sustainability in any sector. So it's a good time to sit down with Amalia to discuss the journey that Teva has been on over the past few years, to share her advice for anyone who wants to make an impact on their company's sustainability footprint, and how to keep momentum on ESG at times of crisis. Amalia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Hi, Luke. Good to be here. It's great to see you. Amalia, you've got a fascinating and global career, starting off within government and international affairs at organisations such as the World Health Organisation before going into companies like Pfizer or where you are now at Teva. Just interested in what perspective that gives you on the life sciences industry, having gone from that kind of background. I think I have uh, an outsider perspective. Hmm. Uh, wherever I go. And the reason is that I started to work in the health area at WHO with no background, no formal education in health or public health. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nevertheless, I was uh, leading uh, the development of a strategy which is quite pivotal uh, to the world, I believe, because it's about prevention of uh, chronic diseases uh, and the relationship of prevention with diet and physical activity. This work involved a lot of um, corporate affairs, communication, strategy, and policy. But I was an outsider because I wasn't a global health expert and I Mm -hmm. had to rely on on these kind of people and the the best experts in the world to to make this strategy, uh, to to make sure this strategy is finally approved by member states. And when I was at Pfizer, which was my first corporate experience, I had no corporate experience. I came from... Uh, my own consulting. I worked uh, in NGOs before WHO. I worked at WHO. So I had probably brought um, some perspectives that were not common in the private sector, in the pharmaceutical sector. Mm -hmm. And when I moved to Nestle, I came then to a food company. So I did work on nutrition and food and health. Again, it was very, very different. And then moving to Teva was again the same. You know, I came with very much of an outside-in perspective. Uh, to this uh, role as well. So I think uh, this probably is um, how I feel, you know, moving between those sectors. And today I can say that I probably have um, good insights into international and multilateral organizations, definitely into the private sector where where I've spent um, the last 14 years. And earlier in my career, I worked in NGOs and in the parliament. So do you feel as though those two worlds really understand each other well enough? Do you feel as though government really understands the contributions that life science brings? I think that each organization understands something, but they have very different perspective. Hmm. So I I think uh, no one can say that governments totally don't understand the private sector because they regulate, they consult with the private sector. So I don't think it's true. (laughs) I also don't think that the private sector doesn't understand the governments because they have very strong arm of government affairs with the objective of understanding regulations from a legal perspective, compliance, and also from advocacy perspective. Mm -hmm. Having said that, um, the DNA is very different and and there are many blind spots. Um, There there are different objectives, um, different KPIs. Uh, What each sector is mandated to do is totally different sometimes um and even if when there are shared goals the way to get to those shared goals and i'm speaking about public health i think both pharmaceuticals and governments want to improve public health but the way to get there is is quite different um so and the pace is different Mm. so there, there is an understanding but there are many many gaps there was a real feeling of 
unity and togetherness, I think, o- over the COVID pandemic period. And I know that some, particularly in the US, actually, I think are feeling disappointed by the way that the tide seems to have turned against Big Pharma and the Inflation Reduction Act and things like that. What's your feeling in terms of Israel and government support and how it's supporting the life sciences industry at the moment? Well, I think that uh, if we're completely honest, the life science industry needs government. There are governmental investments also in in life sciences. There are governmental investment in academic institutions, which often are leading on the basic science from which, you know, we develop as a pharmaceutical company, uh, the later stage um, clinical trials and and eventually medicines. So there is, um, and, 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 of course, the gov- governments have a very important role in terms of regulating, you know, both the pharma sector and other th- other sectors. I think those rules are very, very important. Um, there is always push and pulls because, you know, each sector is very diverse. And even within sectors, there are different interests. I think, um, uh, and this is why I think it's very important for companies to have uh, relevant government affairs uh, operations, mm. because that's the way to understand what are the governmental priorities, sometimes what are the public health priorities, but also to convey what certain regulation may or may not do in terms of helping patients. Uh, because, you know, we, we all want to aspire to everything, but not everything can be achieved um, you know, in, in the same way or the right way. So I think um, this meeting place is very, very important. And, and both sectors are quite open uh, and participate in this dialogue. My personal belief from my career, I've always engaged in private public partnerships and multi-stakeholder consultation and engagement, because I think this is really how societies can get to the better good. Mm, um, yeah. And, uh, but I, 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 I don't want, I don't think we should dismiss any of the sectors because they have very different roles and they do contribute to one another. Not, not one of them can do anything on its own. Now, let's talk then about Teva and your sustainability journey, because Teva was recently highly ranked in the world's most sustainable companies um, that Time magazine put together. So congratulations. Thank you. From 5,000 companies, only 500 made the list, and Teva was the highest ranking company uh, headquartered in in Israel. So I'm sure this wasn't always the case. So I'm really interested in if we could sort of rewind and go back to when you joined the company back in 2016, when you joined as a consultant. I'm keen to hear about what it was like when you joined and what were the steps to get to where you are today? So first of all, we're very proud of this. I think it's the first time that the Time magazine is issuing this sustainable, most sustainable companies uh, uh, magazine. And we're very happy because we didn't even know that it's happening. So it's completely objective mm. by them and, and the research company that the Time magazine had worked with. Um, so we're very, very uh, pleased to see ourselves there. Um, I, I think that the journey to get to such a, a place um, is one needs to be very systematic and very intentional. Mm-hmm. So I think there was an involvement of both Teva and the world in the direction of leading to us performing uh, quite well with ranking different ranking organizations. Time Magazine is one example, uh, but we participate in a few other rankings as well. We The first thing is understanding that CSR has evolved to ESG a few years ago. And the whole idea is that it needs to be looked at as seriously as we look at our financial performance in terms mm. of measuring, be, having goals and measuring the goals and being accountable to what we do. So I think this understanding and setting an organization up to moving in this direction. Here are the things that are really important for us as an organization. Um, Explaining why they're very important for us. There is a a systematic way of doing it, which is called materiality assessment. It is required by external organizations, but I think the role it plays is mostly internal. Mm -hmm. It's for an organization to 
be able to prioritize what is really relevant and important for, for us as a company. And then once you know that, to be open to the fact that you need to have goals, you need to have to quantify as much as you can. Sustainability is not just exactly like finance, but there are areas that uh, quantification is emerging in a very serious way. Mm -hmm. It means that you need to be open to be transparent. So you, you need to continuously evolve your reporting and come to it from a transparency perspective. How much more we can say to ensure that our stakeholders understand in a simple way and a real way what we're doing and it means that it needs to be a corporate strategy so when i first started it was really the team and myself you know crafting things together i think that quite quickly but it, it wasn't immediately um we convinced management that it's a corporate strategy and we we have a corporate strategy since 2020. So how did you do that? How did you win hearts and minds that these non-financial goals were just as important as the financial ones? Right. I think that it was first constant advocacy and when you understand that there are external expectations, it's very important to use that in a positive way um, reflect back to the organization what are the external stakeholders expecting of you um, so a lot of it is internal um, communication internal advocacy and being being very uh, direct and transparent mm -hmm. and sometimes saying to managers things that they are not necessarily too happy to hear but in a way of you know not challenging them but, but sharing with them the perspectives of the of different stakeholders including inside employees for instance the second uh, thing is that it's not all just what we do i mean esg especially mm. during uh, covid in the early days of covid already has become um really uh present in the world first because of the importance of health and public good and public health and doing good. We then saw, you know, in the US, the unfortunate events, you know, of uh, of George Floyd and, and the whole issue of inclusion, diversity and fairness uh, and equity became very, uh, very meaningful to a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. So, and ESG then became, you know, in a way a trend. So I, I, I have to admit that it helped. But what I think is really important is that it, it we didn't start there. We started really with what we believe on, and that's where we are today. So we are not too concerned, for instance, one can say that there is pushback against the ESG. We, we, don't, we don't buy that. We believe that mm. what we do for sustainability is what, is what we believe is good for, for us to be a good company. Um, and we want to be transparent and report and compliant and so on, but we are not doing it because it's a trend or because somebody is asking us to do that. And I think also um, there was a huge maturity of our executive management and the board of directors who really recognized the importance. I think the voice from the top is very, very important and mm -hmm. it's a critical, critical, uh, you know, element in ensuring that sustainability gets the attention, the focus and the resources. Uh, and that's how you get to be, you know, probably a sustainable, you know, ranked highly in those uh, mm -hmm. ranking organizations. As you look at carbonization across not just what you're doing, but also scope three emissions with your suppliers, how, how do you how do you tend to categorize that? What's most important? When we look at decarbonization, when we look at scope one, two, and three, for Teva, I don't know if it's true for pharma, but I assume it will be uh, similar to other to companies like us. Scope one and two is approximately only 10% of our emissions, mm -hmm. uh, which means that uh, what is in our control is really, you know, the energy that, that we uh, emit or the energy that we buy. And, and those are not as complicated 
as scope three to, to manage. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's easy, you need CAPEX, you need uh, a lot of financial investment, you need to look at your uh, machinery and replacing that is, is sometimes difficult, but this is in our control and we have very robust targets uh, to achieve reduction for scope one and two. We committed to it in a sustainability link bond as well. And we are ahead of, of time for our emissions. Scope three is very, very complicated. It's indeed 90%. Everything that comes in and goes out of, you know, our manufacturing operation mm -hmm. or any office operation. This means that we need to work with our suppliers uh, very closely. And without working with the suppliers, we won't be able to achieve any targets for scope three. Mm -hmm. um, with our commitment to net zero, which is for 2045, uh, we will increase the work on scope three. What we believe, so so we've already identified our most critical suppliers, but I'll be completely honest, it's very difficult because it's out of our control. Sure. Uh, we, we hope that with requirements for reporting or the CSRD in Europe, the new reporting and taxonomy regulations in Europe, all the companies will be um, will have to commit to scope one and two and by and eventually there won't be scope three okay or the responsibility mm -hmm. of big companies to scope three will will be almost will be null because everybody will have to do scope one and two until then it's not easy but we are committing to do whatever we can to address every every aspect of school three, mm -hmm. which again is most of it is outside of our control. Yeah. So we do it through looking at our agreements, educate our agreements, Ecovadis, which is the way we before you contract, you know, a third party, you look at their ranking. So it pushes everybody to be more more uh, responsible on scope one and two. And we do it through engagement with suppliers, education, code of conduct that they need to sign that includes sustainability. So we use many, many, whatever tools that are there to address that. Yep. So I guess EcoVardis being one, Teva yourselves are signed up for science-based targets. Is that also something that's encouraged with the suppliers you work with? Yes. Yeah, so we, are in, we also have a target to ensure that more and more of our suppliers are also SBTI approved. Mm. Um, so that's so. So we have multiple multiple strategies, yeah. uh, and you know, Ecovadis is one requiring certain percentage of our suppliers to be SBTI. SBTI is very complex for companies to achieve. Um, we want to make sure we maintain some inclusion diversity in our with our suppliers. So we need to remember. So some of the processes for Scope One and Two are very challenging for small companies and medium companies. Um, SPTI is very complex, for instance. So you, we always need to have different strategies to make sure that we also maintain, you know, that you don't end up just working with the big and strong ones and you maintain some, also for patients, you want to have diversity in your supply chain and you mm -hmm. want to continue and work with different types of businesses as well. Earlier, Amalia, you mentioned the sustainability linked bond, which I think was a, a 7.5 billion sustainability linked bond. Interested to learn a bit more about that. Is that something which you'd recommend other companies working in that kind of way? How does it work? I don't want to recommend companies anything because a sustainability linked bond, from my experience, was a very unique strategy for Asateva. Hmm. So we, we have, uh, unfortunately, we still have a debt and we are recycling our debt every every year, every other year, depending on our financial strategy. And as part of this um, of this exercise, uh, we are going to the market to issue new bonds and adjust those to our uh, cash flow and, and different uh, financial parameters. Mm. So the sustainability linked bonds was part of, of this, you know, routine exercise that we, we do. Uh, we decided that it's good for us to connect our sustainability strategy with our financial strategy. I think it's a very strong message to, to we, we felt for investors, for bondholders, for the market, for the world, that we take sustainability seriously and sustainability link bond is one of the tools that's out there. Mm. Um, so for us, it was very relevant. 
uh, it allowed us to uh, ensure that also investors who are long term, who are spread in the world in different places, uh, are interested in Teva and, and indeed that proved to be true. Uh, and sustainability in 21 when we issued it was sustainability in bond were really on the rise. So, you know, for companies, it's really uh, also a consideration of the interest rate. There are many financial considerations. So I can't mm -hmm. uh, say, you know, tell any company what to do. For us, it worked very, very well. First, it created a linkage with our financial strategy. It created a linkage between our sustainability goals and our executive um, goals. Um, it created very strong commitment of the company uh, to the market and to the company. And it, it definitely led to a continued uh, elevated transparency. It really is helping us, you know, with showing that we're transparent and we're very focused. Uh, and I think it also really helps with um, convincing stakeholders, especially investors who are very interested in many, many sustainability mm -hmm. topics, just to make sure that they understand where we focus and why focus is important. And by being accountable to the focus, I think it's easy for um, investors to uh, accept the fact that companies like in business, they want to focus on that, something that's very important. So the bond, I think, really helped that, uh, you know, demonstrate that in, in a real way. Given where you and Teva's leadership team are based and indeed the company headquartered, these are clearly very challenging times at the moment in, in Israel. Um, what does that mean in terms of the ESG agenda? And it's not just obviously what's happening now, but also during pandemic or other world events. There's always something which is going to happen, some sort of global event. How do you how do you keep momentum on the ESG agenda? I think the first thing is that we have a purpose. It's we we have the the purpose is that we're all in for better health, mm -hmm. and the purpose. What's behind the purpose is that the patients are, you know, the most important thing for a company like Teva. So from an ESG perspective, this is a very good and easy place to be in uh, because it means that we make sure that employees understand why during, let's take the pandemic for a second, hmm. why they come to the offices despite the risks, sometimes the personal risks. At the same time, our employees are really critical. So both during the pandemic and also now during the unfortunate events that are ongoing in Israel, um, the first thing that our management had been had done is to take care of the employees. Mm -hmm. So making sure that the employees are safe, they have a, a the workplace is safe, um, that we adjust to whether it's the measures that the that COVID required or now. Uh, the safety that we need to offer to our sites in Israel um, was critical. Making sure that employees get everything that they need to cope with the situation. It's important first for the people, but of course also for the company. Um, I'll give you specific examples from Israel. We um, we take care of people who are who's who are in reserve, who are serving, you know, in the military or the, the spouses. Uh, the families um, we've we're taking care, unfortunately, of you know really in person, of people who have been affected. We have quite a few families who are who whose family members have been kidnapped. Uh, we have unfortunately some family, some people at Teva who died or their family members have have died, and people we are providing a lot of mental health support because people are. Uh, even if they're not directly affected, the whole situation is impacting employees. Our management um, stepped up also to help us establish a program in Israel to support the communities in the area of uh, trauma and trauma care. So employees in Israel feel that Teva as a global company really cares also about, you know, the societal um, impacts in Israel. Mm. Um, and we do regular things that we do in any emergency, like product donation and so on. But we've done very focused, we, we've exercised very focused areas to help our employees. 
and to help the communities. And helping the communities also comes back to employees, by the way. And what you would see is that our supply has not been affected. Hmm. We've had instances in Israel where we had less people, but we made sure that all our products, sometimes even more because of demand, left the door on time. We had people from headquarter office going to the sites to pack medicines so that everything goes to the US and Europe on time. So there is a, a real, I think also a culture of can do in the company that helps ESG, you know, and, and that's why I keep saying it's part of the DNA. You know, you mm -hmm. can succeed in ESG if you really, if you don't do this, you know, to tick a box and to fill a report or to satisfy an investor, you do it because you really care about your people and the community. Thank you. That's 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 really interesting and, and really interesting to hear about that all hands on deck on, on the factory floor, making sure that there's no there's no delays. Um, thank you. Um, and then looking at the year ahead. So when you're when you're planning for 2025, what, what are the priorities for you and your team when it comes to ESG? Are there any particular goals you've got in mind? Any particular initiatives which are going to be priorities for you? Yeah, I, I think that um, we have three big um, buckets for our strategy. And we call them in very simple worlds, words. Uh, we call it um, stronger, bolder, and simpler. The stronger means that we want to continue and perform on ESG as good as we can. And that's why we focus very much on the CSRD and being prepared for upcoming legislation and meeting uh, new requirements which didn't exist before and continue to report and be transparent um, and make sure that we continue to strengthen our reporting and transparency uh, along the lines of what are the options and what we feel the areas where we feel that we can always our aspiration is always to be the best and do as and mm. do better even though we're, even if we're doing good we also always want to do better this the boulder is really focused we have a new strategy since the beginning of the year we have certain kpis so it's really focusing on achieving our kpis those are long-term kpis but setting the uh, foundation for new access goals uh, for our environmental goals and continuing to perform on the ethics and, and compliance goals for governance. And the, the simpler is we really focus on making sure that we continue to integrate sustainability into people's day-to-day -day work. Uh, we have a saying at Teva that ESG or sustainability is everybody's business. And we really work through internal tools and, you know, through budget planning and work plans and this kind of very uh, routine uh, processes to make sure that sustainability is embedded and is, is not an add-on, but it's always part of people's, uh, integral to people's role. So these are the areas where we're focusing and we'll Thanks. focus in 25. Thank you. Thank you. And then one final question, um, Amalia, on, on more of a personal level, I suppose. Um, you're clearly or uh, what you're doing at Teva and the wider team is clearly making a real impact. I just wonder what sort of personal uh, fulfillment you get from the role that you're playing. Um, how does it feel? So I, I think... Uh sustainability leads or chief sustainability officers whatever you know the title is the satisfaction is on on multiple levels first of all this is the area in the organization where you really work to create an impact a positive impact and you really work to mitigate negative impact that's our job that's the definition of why we exist so i think that's huge satisfaction uh, the second thing is that it's a very diverse area, so you have to jump always between environment and social and HR related topics. So we may not all be experts in each one of those, but we need to be able to transition between these different disciplines and work with many, many interesting people in the organization from different uh, fields. So that's uh, extremely interesting from a personal perspective. And also, I think what is the third thing that I'd say very gratifying is that 
we continue to see that employees really care about this. It's a, it's critical for employee engagement. Uh, it's critical for recruiting, maintaining people because people want to work for companies who are doing good. Mm-hmm. And you know, being at the at the center, you know, being of you know, kind of coordinating the the reporting is a kind of communication, supporting the company and communicating to current and future employees on the great things that happen across the board is also really, really gratifying. Thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure speaking to you. Thank you. To keep up to date with the latest in biopharma outsourcing, sign up to pharmasource.global. Thank you for listening.